not introduce. Okay, continue. So I'm I'm not introducing ourselves again here. Uh, so let's start with a brief overview of uh, what is technical briefing is about. I will uh, start the presentation by providing you an overview of NLP task for requirements engineering or NLP for RE for short. Then I will hand over the talk to Liping, who will uh, speak about our mapping study of an NLP for RE that we uh, recently published in uh, ACN Computing Surveys. She will also speak yes, about yeah. tools and resources. And uh, finally, we, there will be a, an actual uh, tutorial uh, from Watt, who will teach us uh, something about transfer learning for NLP for RE. So first of all, I give, let's give uh, some basic definitions uh, here. What is natural language processing? We all know what is natural language processing, but here is an intuitive definition. So natural language processing are all technologies enabling extraction and manipulation of information from natural language intended as English, Italian, Swedish, Spanish, etc. So here, uh, as you know, natural language uh, techniques uh, and application are, every, are everywhere and we're using them every day, sometimes uh, uh, with uh, voluntarily, like Google Translate, and sometimes there are applications like all the NLP tools that are behind the different social media that we use that, uh, mm, that manipulate and use our language uh, uh, although we are not aware of that, for example, for giving us advertisements and such. And uh, so we, we, we use and we have natural language processing techniques in our everyday life, basically. On the other hand, uh, with requirements, we have to deal with requirements in our work life, but uh, what are requirements? Well, there are several definitions out there for requirements and uh, they are not always in agreement. They, they look at different aspects of requirements. For, for example, I do, I'm not going through all the definitions here, but uh, in some cases, a condition of a phenomena of the environment, uh, a requirement is a goal, it can be a particular type of statement or an expression of a need. So uh, overall, there's no agreed intentional definition of what a requirement is. So it is good to give some example and give some examples and give an extension of definition then. So here we have a few examples of typical requirements. First example is a user story that is typically used in agile. The second example is a so-called shell requirement, the, the very typical requirement specification, although it is, uh, it is debatable whether the word specification is appropriate or not. And uh, you can have higher level shell requirements, lower level shell requirements, or you can have a structured text expressing the needs to be satisfied by the software. In other cases, you have uh, longer structured uh, text like in the form of use cases, but you can have also other forms. Uh, we've seen already also even in, in the presentations this morning, uh, uh, some papers working on users feedback and in particular on app reviews analysis. App reviews and users' feedback in general, even from Twitter, represent a form of requirement because uh, it contains and includes information about the needs of the actual users. On the other hand, even bug reports are requirements because they specify what needs to be changed in the current software and what are the problems with the current software. And finally, even regulations can be seen as requirements, can be regarded as requirements because, for example, anytime I'm writing down a privacy policy for an app, I'm, I have to abide to the GDPR, which is a regulation and is requirements for my app and to which my, uh, my app should comply. So in this talk, uh, anything that's, that resembles this is a requirement. So anything that reminds something that I've described up to now uh, is considered a requirement. So why are requirements so special? I've mentioned that NLP techniques are, are used uh, quite frequently in uh, different applications. So why requirements need a special att attention and need a technical briefing? Well, first of all, because as you've seen, they are very heterogeneous. You, we pass from uh, a very structured and formal text to almost close to code to 
um, informal texts like the one in the app review. So we need uh, different, uh, different approaches to deal with that. In addition, for example, requirement specifications use their very restricted vocabulary and uh, a very different vocabulary with respect to common text. Uh, by comparing the text of requirements with the one of common text, we've seen that 62% of the words used in requirements do not appear in generic text. So this suggests that NLP tools that are trained on generic text may need to be tailored for requirements. So let's here give an overview of what are the requirement tasks on which uh, NLP can be applied uh, to, uh, to automate, let's say, uh, and provide some automation for this task. So this is a non-exhaustive list. It's just to give you an overview and then before we go into more technical stuff. So a typical case is requirements classification. Requirements classification is uh, it's like the name says, I have a, set, a large set of requirements and I want to partition them, for example, into different functional categories like user interface communication, or I may want to do other types of classification, for example, uh, simply distinguishing between what is a requirement and just informative text. This can be useful for several things, but in general classification can be useful for re later retrieval of the requirement and also for apportionment, apportionment of requirement to specific software modules or models, okay? NLP, of course, uh, can be useful for the classification, the identification of uh, relevant words and associated classification. Directly associated to requirements or classification is users feedback classification and analysis. Here, the task is more distinguishing what is a requirement in the, in the large set of app reviews, for example, uh, what is a requirement and what is just a general opinion or a bug report. This has, a, has another function, the function and the utilities could be for refactoring, for example, the software or for updating in general. I've, I've written not just classification, but also analysis because this has been a very lively uh, and hot field uh, of research recently and also summarization and other typical NLP tasks have been applied uh, to users' feedback. Retrieval is another typical task. For example, how, the, how does it work? Information retrieval, we all know what information retrieval is by our search in Google. <laughs> Apply to requirement. For example, looking here at the picture, I may have. I may have uh, oh, can you jog in? Hello, sir. Uh, can you uh, switch off the microphone? I have no idea who has the microphone. Okay. And, uh, but I imagine that I am a software company. I have a lot of existing requirements that are linked uh, to previously developed product. Uh, and a new customer comes and uh, wants to express new requirements. And I want to understand, uh, for example, uh, what, are, what are the pieces of software that I can reuse? And very frequently, uh, requirements are used as proxy for software similarity, and therefore information retrieval systems can be built that give a new requirement, retrieve uh, old requirements, uh, and uh, in addition allow to retrieve uh, software for reuse. The other cases that is strictly related to this is tracing and relating. As we know, so the software process is not just made of requirements. Actually, the requirements are just a little part uh, and not always uh, written down. We have models, we have code uh, and other artifacts and all these artifacts are traced to each other. And this is another task for NLP for RE. We had also distinguished paper award this, uh, this year on tracing by Jean Klena Wang and, uh, and her staff. And uh, for tracing and relating, again, the, the issue is finding relationship between the requirement and the architecture models, the models about the design and the actual code or lower level requirements or requirements at different degrees of abstraction. The use of tracing or, in, or automated tracing, of course, is for refactoring and impact analysis or also for safety critical product for external assessment. 
defect detection, another typical activity for safety critical product here is uh, similar to classification because uh, given a requirement document, I may want to automatically identify uh, those requirements that uh, uh, contains, for example, ambiguity or some expression of vagueness, passive form, et cetera, to be reviewed later on by a requirements analyst. Information extraction, information extraction is uh, related, for example, to, to the extraction of relevant terms from, uh, from a set of requirements. For example, here I have a large set of requirements and I identify glossary terms like train, automatic train supervision, etc. The usage of this type of information extraction uh, of information extraction technologies is uh, uh, various in the sense that I can use it in their basic form, for example, for construction of glossaries, but also for to support categorization, so classification, the task that I mentioned at the beginning, or for model synthesis, so to identify relevant entities that allow me to generate uh, models from, uh, uh, from the code, models from, from the requirements. Uh, models, model synthesis is another task that uh, can be can leverage NLP techniques. For example, in the, here you have two types of model synthesis. In the first case, you may have some early requirements and user stories, and you want to create a higher level model of what's uh, uh, what is the content of those stories to, uh, for example, for problem scoping. So you extract the entities and extract also their relationship between this element and you visualize them. On the other hand, you may have very detailed requirements possibly belonging to different, uh, to different documents and you want to generate, uh, for example, a feature model or a more detailed model like a sequence diagram like here in the picture because uh, visual models provide a more comprehensive view of requirements and they can really help in the documentation and also in the analysis and reuse. And finally, another complex task, another composite task that make use of information extraction is regulatory compliance. Uh, uh, we have the case in which I have the GDPR, for example, or a set of regulations in general. I want to extract what are the relevant entities that are important for the requirement of my product, and I want to develop the requirement for the actual product. Conversely, I may have a privacy policy for, for a certain app and I want to understand whether it is ambiguous or not, or if it abides to the current regulation. So these are all tasks that are uh, suitable for the applications of NLP techniques. You've seen just a, a snapshot of, of a subset of the possible tasks, but I think it gives you a general idea. Some observation. Most of the array problems, most of the tasks that I described could be solved top down. I could enforce tracing with writing requirements. So I don't need any automated system for finding traces. I could use a constrained natural language to improve quality so that I don't need to detect defects automatically. I can tag classes in advance, so I don't need any automated means for classification, or I can write a grocery in advance, so I don't need to do the term extraction. I can do everything that has been mentioned manually. Unfortunately, this does not happen because the requirements process is iterative and I cannot do and I cannot know everything in advance, and therefore I cannot do everything in advance. And that's why we need an LP. We need an LP also to recover from errors when RE problems are addressed top down by fallible humans. So we need an LP to support us requirements analysts while we perform with uh, our activities. So now I will uh, hand over the talk to Liping that uh, will uh, speak uh, about techniques, tools and resources and will tell you more about our systematic mapping study. Thank you. Thank I you, Alessia. I will now share my screen. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, as uh, Alicia just mentioned, in this part of my talk, I will be mainly reporting the results of our mapping study, focusing on the technology used by NLP4RE research. Our mapping study set out to investigate the landscape of NLP4RE research area. We reviewed five aspects of this area, including publication status, empirical maturity of the research, and the research focus. We looked specifically at RE phases addressed in this research area, RE tasks developed. And we also looked at input documentation types used in the research. We also looked at NLP4RE2 development and the NLP technologies adapted to support to development and the NLP4RE research in general. To understand the publication status of NLP4RE research, we reviewed a total of 404 relevant papers. We found these papers published over four decades, started from 1983. As shown in this diagram, the publications before 2004 are irregular and patchy. However, since then, we can see a year-on-year -year increase in the number of publications. You may notice the number of publications in 2019 was smaller than previous years. That was because our database, the, our database search ends in April 2019. So the number of papers in that year was not complete in our study. Based on our literature search, we concluded NLP4RE is an active and striving research area in RE, and it has produced a large amount of literature. However, the state of empirical research in NLP4RE is less satisfactory. We found the majority, about two thirds of the papers we reviewed are solution proposals, typically involving the development of a new technology, a new solution, and a new technique. We found about a third of the solution proposals are not evaluated at all, but only illustrated using examples, discussion, or simulation. We further find the remaining solution proposals are only evaluated in a lab environment using either students or software subjects. Only a very small number of studies, about 7% of our reviewed articles is conducted in an industrial setting via a case study or field study. Our observation is a typical NLP for RE paper reports a solution proposal, possibly evaluated only internally through experimental example, but without evaluation in the real world. Evidently, industrial uptake of NLP for RE research is very limited. We take comfort, however, this trend 
seems to be common in the fields of software engineering and uh, requirements engineering. Let's now take a look at two development in NLP4RE research. We identified a total of 130 tools developed specifically to support RE tasks as those mentioned by Alessia. But only 17 of them are still available online. Furthermore, no evidence of these 17 tools are still in use. Therefore, as you can see, the state of tool development in NLP4RE research is very poor. In other words, there are no tools available at all for NLP4RE research. I mean, the main specific tools. Without NLP4RE tools, NLP4RE researchers have to solely rely on general purpose NLP technologies to solve RE specific tasks. We identified an extensive collection of NLP technologies that have been used to support NLP4RE research. This includes 140 NLP techniques, 66 NLP tools, and 25 NLP resources. In our mapping study, we differentiated um, NLP technologies into three categories. What we mean by NLP techniques are those that support basic NLP tasks such as part speech, tagging, parsing, or tokenization. What we mean by NLP tools are software systems or libraries for supporting NLP pipeline operations. NLP resources are linguistic data sources for training or testing NLP tools, and we further classify them into two categories, and they are lexical resources such as WordNet, WebNet, and annotated corporal or data sets such as British National Corpus and Brown Corpus. Of the 140 NLP techniques we identified, only 32 of them have been used more frequently. What we mean by frequent use is they have been used at least 10 times. Among these 32 techniques as shown in this diagram, vast majority are what we call word or syntactic based techniques. That means they process lexical or syntactic of the language. We noted baseline techniques such as pause tagging and tokenization and the syntactic passing are most in use and there are only very few semantic techniques. And in this diagram, the three techniques that are marked purples are the semantic techniques. As you know, NLP techniques are often used in combination in a pipeline fashion to perform some specific tasks. There are many different NLP pipelines for processing requirements tags 
but a typical one may be de uh, depicted in this diagram. That is, a input tax will undergo a transformation of tokenization post tagging, dependency passing, lamentization, and stop word removal. And then this transformation will produce different information on the input tax. As just mentioned, we have identified 66 NLP tools. Of them, only one in five in frequent use, as shown in this diagram. The top five most used tools are well-known NLP tools. They are Stanford Core NLP Gate, MI, uh, NLTK, Open NLP, and the Wiki. Most existing NLP tools are open source, including these top five uh, most used tools. And I, I'm listing them here, but I'm not going to go through of them. And uh, I just want to say none of these tools is new. They are all developed in the later 90s, such as Stanford Core NLP has been around for a long time. And uh, uh, some of them probably developed in the early uh, 2000. Okay. So these NLP tools provide um, uh, application and uh, interfaces uh, for easy of use and uh, to support application development. For NLP resources, we found 25 of them in our reviewed papers, but only half, a half of them in frequent use as shown in this diagram. Clearly, what that is most used. And then we also noticed they are only two i.e. specific data sets, which are MODIS and the CM1. And clearly from this list of frequently used NLP resources, we can see a lack of i.e. specific data sets. I'd like to point out our mapping study has omitted many important NLP resources related to RE due to our exclusion of short papers in our review. And such short papers tend to report data sets. Okay. Nonetheless, the available of RE related resources is still scarce. Here, I gave a few of uh, 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 a few of are you related to resources, and at the top we know Promis a repository, which is a very famous one, and uh, it was created by Said and the Menzies from University of Antawa uh, uh, in two thousand five, and it contains twenty publicly available data sets, including uh, MODIS and the CM1. And the pure data set created by our own Alessia in 2017 contains 79 publicly available requirements documents um, collected from the internet. And the user stories created by Fabiano uh, Babius in 2018 which contains 22 data sets, and uh, each data set has 50 plus requirements. FNRE, created by our own Watt in 2018, which contains a data set of requirements annotated with frame net semantic elements. Finally, app reviews um, have 
a lot of data sets, uh, including 13 annotated one reported in this uh, paper given here. And we also found um, uh, mobile app market. An important observation from our mapping study is that since the publication of the landmark work by Jean Claren Han and her colleagues in 2007, there has been a consistent rise in developing machine learning based approaches okay. to support automatic requirements classification. We also noticed since the early 2010s, there has been an increase in using non-traditional requirements texts in NLP 4 RE research, such as app reviews and user stories and so on. Then last year, we saw an upsurge in developing deep learning based approaches, such as using BELT and by LSTM for supporting automatic requirements classification. Some representative references are given here, but I'm not going to go through them. And uh, the, if you are interested and uh, I'll make them available later. So what these trends tell us? First of all, they tell us NLP4 RE research has entered a new chapter. Secondly, it shows NLP4 RE research is undergoing a transformation from traditional NLP and machine learning to deep learning. Third, it tells us researchers in RE have started to use big data to help train NLP for RE approaches and tools. However, deep learning is both data hungry and power hungry because it takes a lot of energy to train machines to learn how to perform some tasks. It's also computationally expensive and financially expensive. So we must find a way to reduce the large carbon footprint of developing such AI technology. So in a wide picture of RE, that means we really need to think about how can we develop more sustainable technologies. However, specifically for NLP4 RE research, the question is how can we reuse pre-trained deep learning models and the technologies to serve the purpose of requirements engineering? On this note, I will hand it over to my colleague Watt, who will give us a short tutorial on the transfer learning, the idea of which might provide a potential solution for us and uh, may help us to learn how to um, adopt existing uh, deep learning technologies for RE. Thank you. What? Thank you, Libby. And hello, everyone. Uh, I will share the screen now. So in this part of the technical briefing, I will give a, a short introduction into the basics of transfer learning and the use of language model in natural language processing. Then I will go through a friendly tutorial on how to use for the first time one of the recent and most promising language model, namely BERT. 
as a human, we have the ability to transfer knowledge across tasks. So what we acquire as a knowledge while learning one task, we can utilize it in the same way to solve a related task. And the more related the task, it is easier for us to cross utilize our knowledge. So let's take, for example, if we have someone knows maths and statistics and has a good programming skills, she will be able to uh, build uh, machine learning models. So we don't need to learn things from scratch. All we need is to learn new aspects or topics, and that's based on our past knowledge. The same concept is also um, applicable with machines. So the goal is to train a model to learn from one type of problem and leverage or use that model, that means the knowledge, to solve the new but related problem. So let's take, for example, if we have a model um, or a learning system which has been trained to recognize different types of small cars, the same model can be reused to recognize tracks, for example. With this feature of transferring or reusing existing or pretend models, we are not only saving time uh, uh, from building models from scratch, but also we don't need any more to collect or label large data sets as we used to do before. So transfer learning in the form of pre-trained language model has contributed a lot to the state of the art on wide range of NLP tasks. If we want to simply define what is a language model, we would say it's a way to represent the relations or the meanings between words in a language. So let's take, for example, the word woman. If we want to consult our language model, let's say it's X, and then we ask what are the related word or most likely related word to the given target word woman, it will retrieve a list of words and with a similarity score that indicate word relatedness. So it will retrieve queen, princess, daughter, and mother. Now this is helpful for many NLB downstream tasks such as question answering system, machine translation, and more. There are many types uh, of language models. The idea of language model is not um, recent. So one of the most recent techniques to build language models is, uh, is, the, is, the, is with the use of deep learning techniques uh, as known as neural language model or contextual embedding. This type of language model has been designed to overcome the context ambiguity and language variation. So for example, if we have uh, the word bank, it will have a different numerical representation as it is uh, a bank in a river or a bank uh, or a bank account. One example of this type of language model is BERT, which is uh, a transformer-based model. So BERT is a pre-trained language model which is originally um, initiated by Google AI to enhance the user experience while searching, uh, uh, while using a uh, Google search engine. There is, there is two paper uh, describe the architecture of BERT model. I will skip this part and uh, go to the tutorial section to explain how we can use BERT. However, the first part of this is um, the attention is, you, uh, is all you need to describe the, uh, the attention architecture or the transformers uh, architecture needed to uh, build the BERT model and the details of BERT model in this paper. So how we can, what can we do with BERT? Well, we can use the BERT model as it is. That means we can use the pre-trained BERT model, or we can fine tune or update the weights in the BERT model to our uh, domain specific data set. And then we can feed this model or the weights in that model into a new classifier or extract the features and train a new uh, supervised machine learning classifier. So um, that the, the, the tutorial will be about uh, classifying a set of non-functional requirements, which is um, divided as usability and security aspect. The data set is found, uh, can be downloaded from this. Uh, let me share the uh, notebook, um, uh, the collab notebooks with you so you can follow me during the tutorial. So the first part of the tutorial, I will be um, explain how we can use the pre-trained BERT model 
without any training or unseen uh, data sets with something called zero shot learning classifier. It's a classifier embedded with um, sentence birth model. And then uh, the second part of the tutorial, I will explain how we can uh, use PERT to extract features from a given data set and train a logistic regression classifier. The final part will not be fully covered due to the time, con uh, time constraints. Uh, so it's about fine tuning PERT with a specific or a limited set of non-functional requirement and use it in uh, a single layer of uh, uh, a neural uh, network uh, classifier. So starting with the first part, which is the zero shot classifier, we start by installing the Hugging Face Transformer. It's a, it's a package provided by Hugging Face. It contains the BERT models and other um, um, retrained language models. Uh, and then I will import the requirement data set needed for uh, this tutorial. So from this uh, data set, I only selected the usability and security requirement to the, conduct the experiment. Now, I already uh, run the, the notebook, but you can do it uh, by yourself. But I would advise you to select um, uh, the, uh, the runtime type to be a GPU to make it faster. So after uh, we installed the transforms and included the needed libraries, including the pre-trained sentence pair model, by using the auto tokenizer, that means the tokenizer used to tokenize sentence as an input to this classifier, BERT based uh, classifier, and the auto model to really uh, to classify uh, the sentence. I created uh, a function or a module, uh, it's called zero shot classifier, that take one requirement statement at a time. And then I will, um, uh, add the, the, the BERT model takes three inputs. One of them is the input ID, the attention math, and the tokens itself. Then uh, it will create two different representation. One is called the sentence representation. That means the sentence embedding and the labels embedding. And then the, the similarity will be generated. And then I will rearrange or reorder the similarity according to the highest score. As you can see from the output here, if we have this requirement, let's say, if the projected data, the, if the projected the data must be readable on whatsoever until the end of the sentence, it's classified this mostly as a usability requirement, not as a security requirement. And if we see that, we will check the scores here. Here. So it's most likely 25%. It's a usability requirement not uh, as a uh, uh, security requirement by 11%. So this is for the, the uh, evaluation, uh, for the evaluation. Now I evaluated already the data sets that I have here. It scores almost uh, 90, um, it's called, uh, sorry, 75% for uh, the security, uh, for the usability class and 73% uh, for uh, the security class. Now, the original paper which presented this data set scores 88% as an F score uh, using a pre trained, uh, or uh, sorry, using a fine tuned uh, PERT model called NORPERT. So, this is for the zero shot classifier. Sorry, I just uh, went the code by mistake. Anyway, the pre trained models or the other type of the model which is using this uh, to extract feature uh, and train uh, a logistic regression uh, classifier, uh, as uh, I started to uh, import the transformer package and the needed package also, then uh, I use the same data set I use with the, the same classifier here. And then I just checked uh, the uh, distribution of the classes that I have in the data set. And as you can see, the usability and security classes uh, more, uh, are equally distributed here. And then um, I imported the distal, uh, sorry, the distal BERT model and also the BERT based model. And we have also BERT large model, which is another type and much larger than uh, these two models. Now BERT has, um, uh, has been extended to uh, different models. One of these models is called distal PERT, which is provided by Hugging Face, which is lighter and faster than the original model provided by Google. But in this example, I use the BERT base uh, uh, model um, uh, by Google. Anyway, I apply the tokenizer. And here I should mention that 
the tokenization process for uh, BERT is different from any other uh, models. It used something called word piece tokenizer and uh, tokenizing by adding special tokens. And these special tokens indicate if we have a separator in a sentence and by adding something called CLS, which is a class token at the beginning of each sentence. This CLS um, uh, used by BERT for the classification task. And that CLS token will contain uh, will contain the embedding that we'll need later to train our classifier. So here um, I have um, retrieved uh, our um, loaded model, uh, BERT model with a pre-trained uh, weight. And then uh, I, um, I use it to uh, classify um, or to, um, to, uh, to uh, train or to uh, predict the weight of our requirement set. And then um, here I have identified the maximum length. That means that we need to include something called batting here. Uh, we, in our data set, we have different lengths uh, of a requirement statement. Each statement, for example, maybe we have five words, another statement, six words, another statement, 10 words. So we have two ways, uh, either to specify a fixed size, that means uh, the smallest one, or we consider the highest or the maximum uh, length. And uh, for, uh, we could, because we need to make um, an equal sequence of, uh, of, uh, of sentence. And we bad the remaining tokens with zero. So for example, for a sentence with five words, we will um, bad the remaining five places with zero. And this is called the badding phase. Great, then yeah. we add something called masking, the attention mask. And this is something, uh, if we pass the bad uh, to the, the, the directly send the badding um, layer to the BERT, it will confuse it. So we need something called attention max and the uh, details of this layer is explained in details in the, in the paper. And then, um, as I said, the, the tokens, uh, after it's tokenized, I, 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 after it's uh, trained and tokenized, I will take only the first um, tokens of each sentence, which is the CLS. And the CLS will contain um, the embedding of the entire sentence. And that's what we need as a feature to classify that sentence. So from the last hidden state, which is the contextual embedding resulted from a BERT model, I will use the first um, CLS token here as a feature. And then uh, normally I will use the same feature to train our uh, classifier, the, uh, our logistic regression classifier so easily. So here I have divided our data set into train and test data set. And then I um, look for the uh, optimal C parameters and then I apply this with the, log uh, the, with the logistic regression, uh, uh, logistic regression model here. And then I have put, uh, there are several options that you can try by yourself, different classifiers. And then I evaluated the score. It was 88, almost 88 uh, as, as a score, which is um, reasonable enough comparing uh, to, the, um, uh, to the result uh, reported in the original paper by North, uh, North, North The final part, which is the fine tuning, it's about how we can uh, utilize um, the last layer of the contextual embedding and fine tune it or update the weights in the BERT model according to our customized data set. Now, there are so many details in this, um, in, this, uh, in this part of the tutorial, so I would like to leave it to you, but there are some comments that could help you to uh, change and to test a different uh, way to train uh, the embedding layer. So in this part, BERT architecture, this is layer, the layer we use to fine tune um, the, the model itself. So uh, this. So language model really assists to identify contextual information. And this is really helpful for NLB variety task. It could help to classify requirement on the fly by defining and define labels and also to help auto-complete requirements uh, during, for example, requirements collection phase or enabling the usability of requirements from large resources. However, using the um, pre-trained um, uh, model directly without fine-tuning might not bring the best results. So fine-tuning is, is um, highly encouraged. And I would like to refer to this um, 
resource. Uh, by he he uh, he developed um, uh, a breach, sorry a fine tuned PERT model last year, and the paper was uh, presented in RE conference last year. He has done uh, really good ex uh, experiments in how to fine tune um, a BERT uh, model to classify function and non-functional requirements. However, um, there is a, a, an issue with uh, the use of language uh, model, and this is um, um, related to the ethical use of such um, uh, uh, of such pre-trained model. Yes, they are large. Yes, they could help to identify um, meaning and context, but they um, they were trained on unfiltered and observed um, text uh, data set. So uh, there are some bias that may be encountered in this uh, language model that need to be carefully. Uh, detected. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Now I will leave the conclusion with Alessio. Thank you very much, Wad, for the very, very nice tutorial. Okay. So here is a short summary of um, of this presentation and i want to, to conclude by showing you this slide that i used uh, three years ago in a technical briefing uh, at an at an about nlp for re at ICSI. so here i, I tried to make uh, to make the a picture of the progress of uh, the resolution of nlp for re task and uh, as you can see I, I tried to partition between mostly solved making good progress is still very hard at that time, nothing was mostly solved. There were some tasks making good progress and still very hard task was tracing all the synthesis and regulatory compliance. I made this exercise also this year, uh, reflecting on our mapping study and the recent publication at ARIA at ICSI. As you can see, nothing has been fully solved uh, in a way that can be used uh, uh, in industry in a large, uh, let's say, in a, in a, that, have, that can have a large use in industry. But there are several tasks that are making good progress and especially in the field of classification and feedback analysis, also thanks to the several data sets that came in the last years and also thanks to the transfer learning technologies that uh, um, that what just presented. Still, there are tasks that are very hard and uh, the overall scenario is slowly changing somehow. But we see that progresses are made. So when we've solved all these issues and uh, we have applied uh, all the techniques that are available, what's next? Well, we hope to see a little bit uh, something that goes beyond NLP for RE and takes into account the fact that requirements are not normally expressed in natural language. Although everyone that has been writing or that has written a, a paper um, on NLP for RE probably uh, have written requirements are normally written in natural language. Well, they are written in normally in natural language, but uh, they are not expressed at the source in natural language because uh, we, we do interviews, so we do requirement solicitation in some different forms that is often verbal, or uh, we do focus group and video RE meetings, uh, and uh, we have also requirements in the form of uh, models. And uh, in addition with the data-driven RE, we have uh, requirements coming from data analytics, so associated to the usage of products. So the next challenge, the next goal, is to be able to use this automated technology to go beyond natural language and analyze multimodal requirements that come from different sources. And this is a challenging avenue that, uh, uh, that we should, uh, we believe we should all explore. So uh, that's it for, for this presentation. And uh, so we have presented, I presented shortly at the beginning, a set of task families, let's say a set of ta typical tasks for RE. Then Liping made an overview of what is the status of NLP for RE research currently. And then what gave us uh, uh, some pointers to what can come next and what is actually coming now with uh, BERT, transformers and these uh, transfer learning technologies. 
And uh, now I give just very few reflection on where to go next with multimodal requirements. So we are now opening the floor for, for, some, uh, for some questions or clarifications, or if you want to, to see more about the tutorial and uh, yeah, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you.